Afternoon, everybody. I think we'll get started. So thanks, everybody, for joining today. Uh, we're trying to branch out and get a couple of talks from the research community this year. And one of the suggestions that we had from Shafak down at uh, Central Florida is that we should uh, have a couple of talks on some of the, the test beds and uh, cloud infrastructures that uh, a lot of us use and maybe some of us aren't aware of, but want a little bit more information on. So Kate was uh, uh, really great to give us some of her time today to talk a little bit about Chameleon. So Kate, I'll throw it over to you if you want to get started. All right. Thanks very much. And thank you very much for inviting me as well. Um, so my name is Kate Cahey. I'm a senior scientist at uh, Argonne National Lab, but also at the Computer Science Department at University of Chicago. So I've got a, a joint appointment. I'm I'm in my University of Chicago office right now. So this is this is my wonderful office uh, on the Chicago campus, um, and I'm going to talk to you about an NSF-funded project called Chameleon. Uh, I'm the lead PI. Uh, of Chameleon. Uh, it's my favorite topic. Um, and also, I will mention briefly then later a, a project that uh, in some way was uh, an offshoot of Chameleon or realization of an opportunity that Chameleon created uh, called Flotto. And one thing I wanted to clarify up front, Jason, how much time do I have? I forgot to ask. Oh, you have a full hour. A full hour. Okay. Well, we probably won't need all of that, but um, I love talking about chameleon, so I might actually uh, I might actually fill that up. Uh, so as I mentioned, I'm the lead PI of the project. Um, my partners on the project are Texas Advanced Computing Center. Uh, Dan Stanzion, the director of TAC, is is the co PI. Uh, Renzi, uh, Paul Ruth who is also the PI of the Fabric testbed, which is a fantastic testbed for networking research uh, that, that uh, integrates with Chameleon. You can run experiments over both Fabric and Chameleon. He's also a co-PI on Chameleon, and, and Joe Mambretti from Northwestern uh, is a co-PI as well. So it's a partnership. Uh, oh, and um, uh, Haryadi Gunawi, one of my colleagues uh, on the University of Chicago, uh, faculty is also uh, a PI. So uh, it's a partnership of four institutions. Uh, we've got five PIs, uh, and it's been a, a fantastic project that has been uh, in existence for uh, uh, quite a few years now, and I'll talk about all of that. I wonder if I can get rid somehow of the buttons here and the various different captions. Uh, well, if, if somebody can figure out how to do that, that would be helpful. But I know these slides very well, so I can probably talk to them even though I can't see them. Uh, so first, Chameleon in a nutshell, um, a, a few points that are important to know about Chameleon. So we support uh, a great variety of hardware infrastructure from large to small. So the system is located in two supercomputing centers, one of them is uh, ALCF, the uh, Advanced Leadership uh, uh, Facility at Argon National Lab. This is where our University of Chicago uh, hardware is located. I'm a tenant in, in that machine room. And of course, at TAC, the Texas Advanced Computing Center, those are two uh, large supercomputing centers, very modern facilities, um, and, and have very professional stuff that operates that hardware. So we support both a large investment into uh, a variety of nodes, um, uh, nodes that are sometimes uh, unique or, or customized to supercomputing needs, uh, such as, for example, the Fugaku nodes. We support a lot of a great variety of, of GPUs, uh, FPGAs, uh, all sorts of different storage devices, a great variety of storage devices, to uh, very small edge devices that can be deployed outside of data centers, right? So we've got fantastic data center uh, facilities, but we also support our users deploying edge devices wherever they need to deploy them. And you see this picture of uh, a little uh, autonomous car. Uh, we had um, a, a lot of excitement about these last summer. We had a lot of students doing interesting research uh, using autonomous vehicles, and they actually collectively produced a, a teaching module 
uh, using uh, for autonomous vehicles, right? Those vehicles are not hard to get so that anybody could get them, add them to Camonion, and leverage them in conjunction with our uh, facilities in the data center and do interesting research on, on edge to cloud type of interactions. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit uh, later on, give you some examples specifically uh, that students worked on last summer. And so uh, finally, what we have uh, most of Chameleon hardware is located into at University of Chicago and TAC in those large supercomputing centers. We do also have many volunteer sites. So we created a packaging of um, Chameleon called China Box. This makes installing Chameleon infrastructure relatively easy. And I'm saying relatively easy because in general, this is uh, a very hard infrastructure to create, right? And I'll explain in a moment why. But we also have now um, facilities at NTAR, at Northwestern, and UIC, and we are in discussions with others. And those are volunteer sites. They are doing this because they want to learn about managing that infrastructure, or in some cases, because they have classes that they want to run on that infrastructure. It's interesting what motivations the different centers have. Um, and, and so they are not uh, supported under the Chameleon grant directly. So the second important thing to know about the system is that, as, as I think everybody knows, chameleons like to change. Uh, and, and so we provide uh, facilities that allow you to adapt the but to your experimental needs. Um, so uh, the, the chameleon hardware is available on a bare metal basis. So you can have bare metal reconfigurability, which of course gives you root. Uh, but you can also uh, reboot the nodes, you can boot from custom kernel, you get access to serial console, you can modify the firmware, and so on and so forth, right? So this is really extremely important if you are uh, doing experiments in power management, for example, or experiments on performance variability. In that case, doing it in the cloud where, yes, you have root, but there's that hypervisor layer between your experiment um, and, and the machine uh, is not always viable. But now that said, we do provide, um, uh, we do configure a small partition of the system as a KVM cloud, but that makes it much easier to get at the resources um, for projects uh, in education, for example. Uh, another important thing to know about Chameleon is that it's based on mainstream open source platform called OpenStack. And while some of you may be familiar with OpenStack as something that provides um, open source implementation of infrastructure as a service, and in other words, allows you to deploy virtual machines on, on resources, OpenStack also has a component called Ironic that supports bare metal reconfiguration, right? So we've got most of uh, Chameleon is configured using OpenStack with Ironic gives you bare metal reconfiguration. Small partition is configured using OpenStack uh, with KVM. And that again gives you uh, faster deployment uh, for uh, virtual machines deploy much faster than bare metal reconfiguration. Uh, and it makes it just easier to work uh, with educational projects or with research projects that don't require bare metal reconfiguration. It also makes it uh, easier to share resources, right? So that makes it then cheaper to provide the test bed because uh, bare metal resources, you typically get one resource per configuration. And lastly, we provide a, a wide array of services that support uh, sharing digital artifacts, uh, that support reproducibility. And I'll talk about that uh, some more later on as well. Okay, so Chameleon in numbers, uh, a little bit of information for uh, about the project, how long it's been in existence. Uh, over eight years at this point, we were celebrating the eighth birthday of Chameleon uh, last July, uh, so July 2000, uh, uh, 2023. And so round anniversary for us, eight being a very, very round number for uh, in binary especially. Uh, so we're going to be showing off this cake for another few months, probably. Uh, during that time, we had the privilege of serving over 9,000 users 
who were working on, at this point, over 1,100 unique research uh, and education projects. Actually, uh, computer science research, education, and emergent applications. As we support on, on Chameleon, we don't support uh, production science. Um, and all those users uh, working on Chameleon produced over 600 uh, publications that we were able to find. It's not always easy to track, but uh, the, the 600 plus 642 is, is the number, is the papers that we are sure were produced using Chameleon. Uh, others uh, we're still uh, looking for. So uh, 9,000 users, that's a cumulative number. Uh, on a monthly basis, we support typically around 700 unique users. So around 700 unique users per month log into Chameleon, use one of our resources. Uh, this is a quick look at Chameleon hardware and, and how the system is structured in general. So like I mentioned earlier, we have uh, two main sites, one at University of Chicago, uh, one at TAC, and um, these, these boxes give you a, a quick overview of roughly what hardware resources we support. So you've got all those different generations of um, uh, Intel processors that were acquired uh, over multiple generations of Chameleon, uh, a range of accelerators, uh, a range of different storage systems, uh, and networking, uh, various different networking arrangements, uh, and so on and so forth. And then you see a third box for Qi at Edge. This is uh, support of our Edge infrastructure, about which I will talk uh, more in detail later, and we support various different edge architectures, but then we also allow users to add their own devices to the testbed and use testbed uh, services like, for example, authentication via federated identity or uh, interface to the testbed via Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, at University of Chicago, we've got half a petabyte of global storage. At TAC, we have 3.5 petabytes of global storage. The two sites are uh, connected via 100 uh, gigabytes per second uh, network. And then we're also connected to uh, various, like I said, volunteer sites, one of them at NCAR, at UIC, uh, at IIT, and at Northwestern. And you see sort of grayed out Purdue logo. Uh, this is a test bed that was, uh, a, or a site that was added on an ephemeral basis um, in uh, uh, 2022, specifically to support the SCC uh, or student competition, HPC student competition uh, at supercomputing. And I'll get back to that uh, later. And like I mentioned at the very beginning, we're also integrated with Fabric. So you can run interesting uh, uh, complex networking experiments over both Fabric and Chameleon. And this is just a, a fly-by slide that has a lot of detail about the hardware that we support. So later on, uh, if you're interested in looking at the uh, uh, at, at specifically what there is, well, you can go to Chameleon website, but if you don't like websites, uh, you can look at that uh, on the slide as well. Okay, so we have a lot of hardware, and now the question is, how can you get that hardware? So if you think about your typical experiment workflow, so you form a hypothesis, then you figure out what you need in order to, uh, to validate that hypothesis. So you're presumably going to need some hardware. So if you're working on machine learning, for example, you might need some GPUs. So you need to figure out what hardware Chameleon has. Uh, then you need to allocate those resources, so somehow gain temporary ownership of those resources. And for computer science experiments, it has to be interactive. Then you configure those resources, and then finally you run your experiment and, and you monitor it. So for resource discovery, uh, like I said, we have discovery services uh, on the websites, and, and uh, they provide a very fine-grained, very detailed picture that is also very complete and versioned and, and maintained um, uh, automatically. Now, once you figure out which specific, we also have availability calendar that, that lets you know which resources are um, currently in use and for how long they will be in use and which resources are available and or when they might become available. So once you figure out which resources you want, and when they are available, uh, you need to somehow 
get hold of them, so so gain ownership, gain temporary ownership of them. And uh, while, of course, we would love to, uh, if, if all of them were available on demand to everybody all the time, that is, of course, not always the case because we have limited resources. So GPUs, for example, are very popular right now. If you come to Camellion and want some GPUs, chances are that they all might be in use or, or the ones, the A100s, the most popular ones might be in use. So what you can do, if that's the case, you can make a, an advanced reservation for when they are available, right? So you can look ahead to the future and make advanced reservation for when they are available. And those advanced reservations are also very useful uh, if you, for example, are, are planning to give a demo to your class or if you know that you will be submitting a paper uh, at, a, at a certain time and you will, do, will need those resources, let's say a week before that paper deadline, right? So uh, you can make advanced reservations. If they are available, you can reserve them on demand. You can reserve no, uh, nodes, you can reserve VLANs, you can reserve IPs, right? So it's not just for nodes, it's for uh, other elements of the system as well. And uh, the fungible non-fungible here means that you can reserve by resource type. So you can you can come to the system, for example, and, and say, give me one of the AMD nodes or give me, uh, give me one of the Skylake nodes or you can reserve a specific node. So again, some of our users, uh, if, especially people who work on, let's say performance variability, value the ability to work with a specific node because then they get consistent results, right? So they eliminate one source of variability, variability between nodes, um, and they can get consistent results on the same node. So that's a, an important feature for us to support. So once you, get those nodes, you can uh, uh, reconfigure them on, on bare metal uh, basis, like uh, I explained earlier. Uh, for KVM, of course, you're deploying a, a virtual machine. And when you reconfigure edge devices, you do that by uh, deploying a container. We provide a catalog of images, uh, something like 13 or 15 images that uh, have software that is specific to various hardware nodes. So for example, we support CUDA, we support TensorFlow images with CUDA and TensorFlow so that you can more easily program the GPUs, but you can also configure your own uh, software on those images and then you can snapshot them. So snapshot them, so save the images with your configuration. So next time uh, when you deploy images on Chameleon, you can deploy from those snapshotted images. And you can also um, configure them to form things like, um, like virtual clusters. So you can use uh, a service called Heat that deploys uh, multiple images and configures them for you if you're using complex configurations. Um, or you can just program the same thing in an imperative style by using the command line or by using our Python G library. Um, uh, and then of course we support network stitching uh, and, and also we, well, we used to support bring your own controller on our Corsa switches. They are temporarily offline because we are reprogramming the way you can um, allocate switches. So you're going to have many more degrees of, of freedom when you program interesting networking topologies on Chameleon um, and then we'll put them back. So all of this functionality is available to you via a GUI, via command line interface, or via Python G, right? So you can programmatically create your experimental environments on uh, the test bed. Programmatic interface is very important because that supports reproducibility. Uh, and then also uh, you can use the programmatic uh, types of, uh, of, of creating the environments uh, via Jupyter interface, right, where you can also annotate them. So uh, uh, we have both support for Python G and Bash kernel. And if you want to learn more about how the test bed is configured and why we made certain design decisions, there's a, a fantastic paper, Lessons Learned from the Chameleon test bed that explains that. Um, G in a box, I mentioned that earlier, is simply a packaging of Chameleon infrastructure. So all the implementation of the capabilities from the previous slide, 
And in addition to packaging uh, the, the capabilities of the test bed, it also packages our operational model. So all the operational tools that we use. This makes it much easier to deploy a very complex system like Chameleon. And in fact, uh, it made it so easy uh, that it made it possible for, for people to uh, deploy Chameleon sites on an ephemeral basis. So for example, uh, uh, a year or so ago, uh, Purdue donated a cluster to the student cluster competition at supercomputing, and it took them only one week to deploy a Chameleon site. Right, so that's that's uh, typically a, a system of this complexity. It takes months to configure using China Box. We were able to reduce that to one week, which was fantastic because they only uh, deployed that system, that site for uh, a few months to support the competition specifically. So this was very interesting because it amortized the deployment time uh, to the point where we can create ephemeral sites uh, uh, for Chameleon and, and support uh, targeted initiatives like that. And some people are now saying, well, maybe we can add resources to Chameleon on an ephemeral basis for reproducibility initiatives specifically. So if somebody would need access to some unique hardware to reproduce a certain result, they would be able to add those resources. Um, we're working, uh, like I mentioned, there are multiple sites that um, use Qi in a box uh, to add sites to Chameleon on a volunteer basis. There are different motivations between those additions. So for example, for NCAR, they had some um, ARM uh, Thunder nodes uh, left from testing for, for building their next supercomputers and not really many takers from that. And they decided to donate it to Chameleon, which was fantastic for our users because those were top of the line nodes at the time when they were added, which was three years ago. Um, and they got much interest from the community. It was very good for NCAR also because that allowed them to amortize their investment in hardware for testing. So it was great for, for both sides. A another type of motivation, for example, is uh, Purdue, I already mentioned, they donated hardware, uh, a cluster that um, they were later on decommissioning specifically to support uh, an HPC uh, student, student cluster competition. So uh, that was uh, fantastic. And we're working with others to also support uh, other Chameleon sites. And again, if you'd like to uh, uh, read more about China Box, uh, we've got a paper for that. So here's how we uh, took the path at some point, uh, how we evolved from uh, supporting cloud resources or fundamentally data center resources to supporting resources at the edge. So over time, what became clear is that our users were increasingly more interested in, in using resources on the edge and in programming edge to cloud interactions. And you've got uh, examples of three projects here. Uh, in network traffic fingerprinting, in federated learning, and in biometrics. Um, and we engaged with those users and uh, you know, tried to adapt the testbed uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to, to the extent that was possible at the time to serve their needs. But, but ultimately, uh, nothing replaces the real thing. And so we engaged with them and, and tried to understand their requirements. And out of that came uh, out a vision for a realistic edge to cloud test bed uh, where you could run edge to cloud experiments from one Jupyter notebook. And this is um, what we ultimately developed. It was part of our scope for, for the third iteration of, of Chameleon, which is ongoing now, Chameleon 3. Uh, and we called it Chi at Edge. Chi stands for Chameleon Infrastructure. This was Chameleon Infrastructure at Edge. And you know, when we were originally engaging with users, they would tell us, we want something like Chameleon just on the edge, right? So uh, all the features that we know on Chameleon, but uh, on the edge. But then uh, when you know, a push came to shove, right? When we started, when the rubber hits the road, it's like, well, uh, this is going to be infrastructure that is not in the data center. It's going to be somewhere out there in the wild. Um, additionally, those various edge devices, which we define as, as devices that, you know, lightweight devices like Raspberry Pis or say NVIDIA Nanos that still support 
uh, Linux, right? So they're still relatively powerful. Uh, those edge devices are typically coupled with some sensors, with cameras or or um, uh, air quality sensors or things like that, or maybe software defined radius. Software defined radius was a was a very popular uh, experiment requirement. So uh, you know how do we do that? That's again not something that we're experiencing in the data center. And then lastly, those edge devices don't support IPMI, which is needed for bare metal reconfiguration. But at the same time, users also told us we don't really need bare metal on those devices. They are cheap enough that if we want bare metal, we can buy one. The, uh, the, what we do want on those devices is some sort of recipe for sharing them uh, and, and sharing them securely and being able to connect them to the data center resources in, in a seamless fashion. So I don't have to learn two different paradigms of operating those things. Uh, so out of that came infrastructure, which uh, reconfigures those devices via container deployment, right? So bare metal was not needed uh, in the end, supports different IoT peripherals like, like cameras or other types of, of or software defined radios or other types of sensors and it supports that both for resource discovery and such that users can actually connect to those sensors and do whatever they want to do. And it supports the bring your own device paradigm because uh, what users told us is, well, you guys could put some of those devices uh, in your data center or in your lab, and we did, but they're not that very interesting to us because typically we want to connect them to some camera or some other sensors that we have. And, and those things are here where we are, they are located close to us, right? When we want to observe something through that camera or, or, or those other sensors. So what we would like to do is we would like to add our own uh, Raspberry Pis and Nanos uh, to your test bed. So we had to ultimately develop uh, methods for that. And if you want to, uh, again, learn more about uh, these types of requirements, and, and also how Chi at Edge was structured, uh, you can look at the report from the third Camellion user meeting, uh, which we held in 2021, uh, where the users uh, uh, described the experiments that they were running on Chi at Edge and, and also told us how to improve it. Um, so um, one of those users um, actually came to us and said, well, you know, I would like to deploy a thousand devices to measure broadband. Can I use Chi at Edge for that? And Chi at Edge was not really designed for that because when we looked a little bit closer at his requirements, um, he really, he was he wanted to measure broadband to deploy those devices in, in small businesses and in people's homes, uh, deploy a thousand of them, which was a, a challenging scalability requirement, but, but also he was working, so Chi at Edge has been developed for computer scientists, so people who are relatively savvy on how they want to uh, configure infrastructure, have a high level of skill, high tolerance for system complexity, but also need a lot of control over the system. Uh, his users were users who didn't need control. In fact, uh, were just wanted zero touch installation, just plug the device in, um, but, but then also could not tolerate much in the way of complexity. So uh, we had to change the approach and develop something that was uh, a measurement box that a user could just plug into the router and then run tests. And those tests, uh, uh, so this, this particular user was actually my uh, one of my colleagues at University of Chicago, Nick Feenster. He uh, His area of research is broadband. Uh, he developed a package called Netflix for measuring broadband, and, and he measures broadband. His, his group is interested largely uh, in technical questions, so such as, for example, what happens if uh, uh, you're in condition of oversubscription. But then um, he also works uh, uh, or runs an initiative called Internet Equity Initiative, which investigates various policy questions. And uh, I think that probably most everybody here heard Broadband is a big topic right now. We want to uh, uh, investigate the digital divide in our society. We'll understand it, first of all, and then provide 
mechanisms that would make it disappear in, in as much as possible, right? Give um, everybody an equitable access to uh, internet. But then also data on broadband could be used to modeling questions. So people can use it to uh, uh, the information about how broadband behaves in practice uh, to model uh, various, to, to use that data to, to, uh, for emulations and experiments, uh, for example, on federated learning and, and other uh, experiments where information broadband is needed. So anyhow, we, we took this basis uh, to provide this infrastructure. We took this basis of, of Chi at Edge um, and we developed a, a slightly different uh, infrastructure, which however does share a, a lot of elements still with Chi at Edge to provide um, infrastructure that does this zero touch device enrollment. So literally plug it into your router, you're done. It's non-invasive to uh, network tests, right? Doesn't interfere with text tests, provides operations without physical access. That's already true of, of Chi at Edge. Is scalable to 1000 devices. So we are in the process of the throttle project. We are in the process um, of deploying a, a thousand devices over various different areas. And some of those deployments have in fact finished at this point. And then we also said, let's make it adaptable. Let's make it adaptable. And right now under the MPCC project, we are uh, uh, verifying the hypothesis that those devices can be adapted to work with other uh, types of things that might be uh, interesting from the perspective of, of uh, climate uh, discovery. Um, so with, with air quality sensors, water quality sensors, and other types of environmental sensors. Um, and we also, of course, need services that include data curation and preservation and, and things like that. Um, and, and a quick overview of the plot of deployment. So we're deploying um, uh, 200 devices for broadband research in uh, uh, over the city of Chicago. We're deploying 300 in Milwaukee. We're deploying 300 in San Rafael. Those are beginning to pop up right now. And uh, I alluded earlier to a deployment that was already uh, completed. That was in Marion County, Illinois, where we deployed 2030 devices. That's a picture uh, on the bottom of the screen. And then we're also working with ESnet uh, to deploy some of those devices for sale. And that's the uh, picture of the, of the tower that you see uh, out in Colorado. So if, you, if you'd like to learn more about the project, there's an URL uh, where you can learn that, right? So just to uh, uh, reiterate again, this is distinct from Chameleon. This is something that evolved out of our uh, investment in Chi at Edge in Chameleon. So now to uh, change gears a little bit, I would like to talk a little bit about reproducibility. Because reproducibility is something that I don't think is really going to take off unless we have access to open platforms, right? Because having code on GitHub and having it be uh, theoretically reproducible only takes you so far. If you need to reproduce it on unique hardware, uh, which is often the need in, in computer science and in particular in uh, HPC and in networking, in, in system science, I would say, in, in computer science systems areas in general, um, it's important to also have access to hardware. And it's particularly important if we reimagine reproducibility as something that takes place only as part of reproducibility initiatives and only you know, when the, when the paper is first presented and only to perhaps validate research, if we reimagine it to be something that is more mainstream. Um, so for example, could I use it, uh, use reproducibility as a, as a mainstream method of, of scientific exploration, just like I read papers now, right? So reading a paper, I could click through a graph that I see in the paper and be able to redo the experiment or redo the data analysis that went into producing that graph. Or I could experiment uh, or redo the experiment and then maybe uh, try something else, try changing that experiment slightly. I could 
come up with a new result, right? Or I could uh, hear about an interesting new experiment uh, at a conference and immediately use it in my class, integrate it in my class, right? So it, things like that, interactions of this kind, uh, I started calling them practical reproducibility. So in other words, practical reproducibility would be a way of using reproducibility as the mainstream method of scientific exploration. Very similar to what we do when we read papers today, right? So instead of read, or in addition to reading papers, I could also play with the results interactively. Um, and in Chameleon, we're trying to facilitate this, this practical reproducibility, right? Whether we'll succeed, well, is another problem. But um, I'm a little bit optimistic and it's based on, on two observations. Observation number one is that we now have open platforms for computer science research. This is amazing and fantastic and extremely, extremely important because, uh, again, if all we have are the digital artifacts that describe an experiment, the data and the code, I mean, that in itself, please don't get me wrong, is, is already an amazing achievement. But, but having just the data and the code is a little bit like having a car without a road, right? It, it doesn't look pretty. And it might be okay for certain types of car, but generally speaking, if you want to get somewhere, it's best to have both the car and the road. Right, so we now have all these fantastic open platforms for computer science research. Maybe we could use them to make our science more efficient and more interesting, exploring it more interesting because I can touch it interactively. And the second observation is that those test beds are all programmable, right? So. Uh, and I and I call it here cloud pattern, but what I really mean is programmability. So uh, if you are experimenting and you're experimenting on on some machine in a lab or or maybe your laptop, you very often don't really know what the configuration on that machine or on that laptop was. I mean, maybe somebody else configured it for you, or maybe you forgot what was in there. But when you go to a cloud, you have to deploy an image. And that image very efficiently uh, uh, integrates all the information about your system, about the system that you're using to validate your results. So I could deploy that image and I could give it to somebody else to deploy that image. And that means that you know all the information that I need to uh, reproduce a result is already there. That saves the reproducer a lot of effort. Uh, it, it could be easy. And then, you know, if I look on Chameleon, we already have thousands of images and orchestration templates and, and Jupyter notebooks that users created that make their uh, experimental environments very, very easy to reestablish. And we haven't done anything yet. We're just using a cloud, and Chameleon is a cloud, right? We're just using a test, but the way it's supposed to be used. And as a side effect of just simply using a test, but using shared infrastructure, as opposed to infrastructure owned by individuals, that takes us uh, a long way towards reproducibility. So what is missing? Well, what is missing is, roughly speaking, three things. Uh, number one, an algorithm for packaging those experiments really well or some consensus on how to package experiments. Uh, number two, making sure that everybody can get access for reproducibility. And number three, some way to discover uh, experiments. And, and so uh, I'm, I'm saying here, this is from the reviewer's perspective, right? If you're a reviewer at some artifact evaluation initiative, those are the things that, that you want. And in particular, for packaging, you want it to be, of course, complete, but you want it in as much as possible to be imperative. You want it to be non-transactional so that you know if something breaks, you can go and bit by bit reestablish the uh, environment and know exactly what it broke rather than one big whole thing happened and it says, well, it doesn't work anymore, right? And it's very hard to figure out what happens. So, better if it's uh, packaged in some sort of uh, 
way that that uh, implements interactivity. But from the reviewer perspective, well, reviewers want the same things, right? But from the perspective of packaging experiments, they want them to be packaged such that are user friendly because of course, because that gives them impact, right? That gives them potentially many people who want to reproduce their experiments and, and therefore uh, those experiments will have impact. But they would also like that packaging to be relatively cost effective. And in as much as possible, a side effect of just simply doing something, which again, on the cloud, if you're doing that on the cloud, a lot of that uh, comes out uh, for free, so to speak. But they want to give access for reproducibility um, and they want to share work in progress. And very importantly, they want to get credit for the experiments that they produced. And so we sort of said those are three aspects where we will investigate and come on how we can provide better services for our users for doing that. And, and from that, we sort of defined uh, three pillars of reproducibility. First of all, end-to-end -end packaging with literate programming. And the best implementation of literate programming right now is a, our Jupyter notebooks. So we not only provide programmable interface to the test but via Python Chiefs I mentioned before, but we also uh, wrap Jupyter around that. So you can write a Jupyter notebook that will create multiple nodes on the test bed and multiple networks and combine them all together to create a complex uh, experimental topology from your Jupyter notebook in a programmable and therefore reproducible fashion. And since it's imperative, it's also non-transactional. You can go cell by Jupyter cell and create that environment bit by bit. And if something goes wrong in the middle, you will know exactly where it went wrong. But then also you, you get the opportunity to, to explain yourself, right? Why did you create certain things the way you did? We provide Trovi, which is an experiment repository that is integrated with the test bed. And the fact that it's integrated to the test bed means that you, know, you, you not only get the code, but you also get a place where this code can be executed. But it also gives us the opportunity to provide some metrics on uh, how many times a, a certain Jupyter notebook or a certain recipe for creating uh, an experiment has been viewed, how many times it's been used. So that gives, uh, it's an experiment in, in providing feedback to, um, to the users on, on how popular the experiments are. We provide something called Chameleon Day Pass, which allows the authors of an experiment to give access to reviewers or give access to users specifically uh, for the purpose of reproducibility. And one last thing I want to say about reproducibility is that over the last year, we have seen enormous uptake of, of the platform as a, as a platform for reproducibility. So we have seen uh, in, in 2022, uh, uh, Chameleon was host to three reproducibility initiatives. Um, in 2023, it was host to seven reproducibility initiatives. And the usage connected to those reproducibility initiatives went up more than sixfold. And of course, it's hard to tell sometimes um, if Chameleon was used for reproducibility initiatives or not, because most of those initiatives are not blind. So in other words, you know who your reviewers are. And many of our users simply add them to their own projects, right? In which case, the information about uh, whether the system was used for reproducibility or not disappears. So this six-fold the usage, six times the usage is just from the, the, the cases where we were able to say for sure that the system was used for that. Okay, and last but not least, I wanted to say Chameleon is not just a system not just uh, a fantastic innovative hardware that you can get access to on a bare metal level, but it's also a community that is increasingly becoming uh, integrated and increasingly having a voice. So in this, in this slide here, you see pictures of our users uh, presenting at conferences, um, receiving awards, uh, working in their labs, 
uh, doing their experiments, participating in competitions, uh, all, all the wonderful work that they have done and experiments in many, many different areas of computer science. And if you'd like to know more about those experiments, um, every month we profile one of our users' experiments on our blog. So if you go to our blog, you will find experiments in all those various different areas of computer science, um, users talking about their experiments and how they used Chameleon specifically in order to run those experiments. But here is a sort of a macro level view of what they have done. So research impacts, uh, I mentioned earlier at the beginning, we've got over 600 publications. This is roughly how they were ramping up. Um, and it, we were not able to identify, unfortunately, all the uh, publications that were produced uh, using Chameleon because our users sometimes forget a little bit to uh, reference the system, but we essentially use um, publications that both user reported, which uh, if the user does not explicitly acknowledge Chameleon in the publication, we ask them for a separate attestation. So we, we talk to them um, and sometimes people say, oh yes, well, students submitted the paper and they forgot to acknowledge uh, that that's okay. I mean, we prefer if you could give us credit, but that's okay. And um, uh, we just do ask for an attestation. And then we also work with Google Scholar, with Scopus and Semantic Scholar to identify uh, the publications that, um, that cite Camoya. Um, so this is the use in, in research. Uh, we've had uh, wonderful results uh, of use of the system in education. And in fact, the, the fourth Chameleon user meeting, uh, the, which took place last year in May, focused on education. Uh, we've got, we found that uh, maybe about a quarter of our users uh, come from educational projects. It's, it's about 10 to 15 percent by project, uh, the educational projects, but uh, quite a few users come from education projects. Some of those users later on uh, go on to do independent research. Uh, but when we started looking at the projects, uh, you know, I, I'm not an educator myself, so I always assumed, well, most of those projects are probably in a class. But it turns out that actually uh, maybe only 50% of them of educational projects or projects that identify themselves as educational projects uh, are teaching a class. There's a great variety of other ventures. There are summer schools, tutorials, hackathons, student competitions. And I, in particular, wanted to call out one student competition, which is an offshoot of the student cluster competition at, at supercomputing. Um, student cluster competition, supercomputing, very prestigious student competition in which students do their own hardware, build an HPC cluster on the on the um, uh, supercomputing on the uh, show floor, and then uh, compete in running an application, an HPC application on that cluster. Now, uh, in the past, it was realized that the barrier to participating in that competition was just simply too high because you have to have relationships with vendors who will supply the hardware and allow you to compete. And many school, many underrepresented communities in particular, simply did not have access uh, uh, to that kind of relationship. And so in order to accommodate them, uh, of people who have uh, you know, the brains and the grit to participate and succeed in, in a competition like that, um, a student cluster competition created the India CC offshoot. So that's um, uh, India CC takes place on Chameleon, or has been taking place on Chameleon since uh, 2021. Instead of bringing a, a cluster to supercomputing, the students get access to bare metal instances on Chameleon, and they compete on the test bed. And this took off really well in, in 2021. You've got the numbers in, in one of the bullets there. In 2021, it started out with five teams. Then that doubled in uh, the following year. And then uh, next, uh, the last year, uh, there were six, 16 teams participating. Uh, some fantastic stories out of supercomputing, uh, out of the India CC competition. So the picture that you see in the, in the top uh, right corner there, is a, a picture of Team Indonesia participating in the competition during a power outage. 
Uh, so the power went down, but it turns out that if you have uh, a battery operated laptop and a modem, uh, you can participate in a, in a prestigious international competition because uh, your actual competition is happening on Camellia, right? So you, you don't need a machine room. Um, uh, you don't need high-end hardware. You don't even really need reliable power. Uh, you can still participate in, in the student competition. So that was fantastic from the perspective of the ability to reach uh, students uh, who are bright but don't uh, and have the talent and, like I said, the grit to participate in this kind of competition, uh, but don't ne necessarily have a, a certain type of resource. Um, and then, of course, the educational projects are also profiled in the blog, just like the educational, just like the, um, uh, just like the research projects. Um, and then, um, like I mentioned last year, our our Kabillion user meeting focused specifically on education. And there are many videos, uh, both of our users presenting during the um, uh, Chameleon user meeting, but then we also organized a special mini symposium on education on the test bed, um, and there are recorded presentations from, from that as well. So if you're interested in education, that could be a good resource. And here is a more specific uh, project that I said I would mention earlier. Last year, we had uh, multiple students working on uh, autonomous vehicles so you can you can buy uh, autonomous vehicles these days for like 200 300 bucks uh, and they were creating during the summer they were creating their own uh, autonomous vehicles they were programming them in a sort of edge to cloud interaction when they were training models um, on chameleon and then running inference on the um, self-driving vehicles this resulted in a, actually a fabulous uh, module that has been added to Provi. So if you're teaching or if you're interested in self-driving vehicles, it's all programmed on Chameleon. Um, and there are different pathways through the model. Um, there are different types of data uh, collection that you can mix and match with different machine learning uh, module, models that you can experiment with and then different modes of, of um, verification, including a digital, a digital uh, twin, because uh, we've got a, a simulation for the uh, self-driving car as well. And then uh, a couple of students got their posters accepted uh, at supercomputing uh, for the ACM uh, student competition. And the last one actually goes back to the cloud because the student was exploring whether he could run inference in the cloud versus running inference at edge, right? So if you if you have a reasonable latency to the cloud, you can run inference models in the cloud. The GPUs are much more powerful than what you can do at edge. And uh, he was exploring trade-offs between that. So it's a system where you can go uh, from cloud to the edge but then you can also go back to the cloud if, if that's where your experimenting takes you. Um, so last thing, since I, it looks like I am going to use the hour, is that uh, we are looking at the system and trying to use it in, in different ways, right? So there's this uh, famous uh, um, uh, saying the, uh, about the Inuit, how they are trying to use all everything from the whale. So they use bones for construction, use meat to eat and, and so forth and so on. So we build a system and we're looking at the system and trying to use every part of it to advance some area. And of course, you were hearing about research and education and that's the sort of most direct use of the system when we're help, helping uh, the broader scientific community to uh, generate results. Uh, but also, by packaging the system as Chena Box, we're enabling testbed operators because they can now deploy their own Chameleon sites. By providing open source Chameleon infrastructure, um, we're enabling testbed developers because they can modify that infrastructure uh, and they can create their own. So, for example, one of the uh, there's a broadband testbed called ARA, which experiments with rural broadband that took Archie at Edge infrastructure, modified it to their needs, and they are running it now. Uh, by basing our system on top of mainstream infrastructure like OpenStack, 
we're leveraging contributions of a large community, but we also made many contributions to OpenStack, including very significant ones, right? So we're, we're able to achieve impact in many areas by making specific decisions about um, how to implement and operate the system. And this is finally my last slide. Uh, Chameleon's a cloud. Uh, Chameleon's chain. So this is a, a cloud that changes itself or adapts itself to your experimental needs, but it also adapts itself to the evolving scientific uh, frontier of science, right? So uh, you, I was talking, for example, about adding edge computing. I didn't mention disaggregated hardware in this talk, but we've got Liquid and GigaIO uh, on, on various R sites now, uh, if you're interested in, in experimenting with that. It's an open platform for reproducible research. And I talked about the various different services that we provide for that. And last but not least, it's not just a test, but not just a pile of hardware, but it's also a community of users who are doing fantastic research every day, making us proud, uh, doing uh, interesting uh, educational projects and, and pioneering new ways of digital content use. So with that, the talk is done, and um, I, I will be happy to answer some questions. All right. Thank you so much, Kate, for going through all of that. And it looks like we had a question come in from Shafak. Uh, the question is regarding corselets or course material developed by the community. Is this available for us? Uh, the Chameleon Cloud Education page does not seem to have the actual resources, trainings, lessons, labs. Is there a process for requesting them? Absolutely. Um, so I should mention, I, I also have uh, another uh, project, or it, maybe not have, I lead a project called Found. So if you go to found.cs.uchicago.edu, uh, you'll find more information about it. But I work with some uh, amazing educators uh, who are creating content, educational content on Chameleon. Um, and it's all available, the best way, and, and it's all available for use and, and you know, has public access and all of those things. The best way to find it is to go to Chameleon Trovi, which if you go to Chameleon main page, there's an experiment button, a, a drop down menu, and there's Trovi on that. And we have a a little uh, hut, educational hut, uh, 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 green logo. If you click on that logo, you will see a listing of all sorts of courses. But you could also you can also search Trovi on the education keyword, and you might find some uh, courselets that are not necessarily produced by by the Found project, uh, but are produced by people who maybe didn't know about the Found project made educational content available. So uh, you can do that. You can also access those. Uh, you can see those courselets uh, under the found web page as well. And if you are in particular interested in educational content, please contact me uh, because uh, I would love if you have some special needs or, or interesting requirements, I'd love to put you in touch with my colleagues uh, who work on educational content and uh, see if we can perhaps uh, either develop something for you or uh, help you in some ways or, or collaborate with you um, or, or generally engage. All right, thank you. And Miriam has a question as well. In the BYOD part, is it mm -hmm. flexible enough to interchange Raspberry Pis with FPGAs? Uh, she is exploring how how they can study eco energy solutions to find greener edge devices. So in, in other words, your edge device would be an, an edge device with an FPGA accelerator. Did I that right? I think that's correct. Yeah, yes. It's, it's, it's absolutely flexible enough and please talk to us. We would be very excited to support this project. Okay. And then last question from Shafak, any plans on being a partner with uh, NAIR, N-A-I-R-R? Oh, we would love to. And uh, we would love to support uh, NAIR. Um, and I think uh, I, I participated in the uh, webinar uh, last Wednesday. And one thing that strikes me of the resources that are available right now 
is that they are all geared towards domain sciences. And uh, many of our users who um, work on projects related to AI really do need that bare metal access because many of them are working on improving performance of models, uh, improving performance. On, and whenever you have uh, those performance related investigations, uh, it's really good to have bare metal availability because again, then you're really close to hardware and there isn't a, a, a layer of additional infrastructure interposed between you and the hardware. And you know, not to mention there are of course aspects of that that are directly systems related uh, in which case you also need bare metal support. So we would love to work with Nair and provide a platform for that. Um, I think that from the edge perspective, it would be also uh, a great opportunity because um, uh, again, uh, uh, AI at the edge, the interplay of AI at the edge and AI in the cloud, um, something that um, like I said, some of our users are already exploring, but providing a good platform for that would be, uh, I think, a great opportunity. So we would love to work with that. All right. I think we have answered all the questions. So thank you again, Kate, for an outstanding talk. Uh, if you can send me a copy of your slides, I'll make sure that they get posted. I will do so. Thanks again for inviting me. Um, and you know, if you have any questions, didn't ask them now, um, send me mail. It was somewhere on the slide, so I'm sure it will be shared. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Thank you all. And next week's talk will be on CC Star uh, with Wendy Huntoon. So we'll talk to everybody later.